Perfect, thank you so much. And that is in progress. Um, so I will hand it over to Sarah. Hello. Wow, everyone, that was a great start. Each and every um, Eon, uh, Allison and Brittany, you guys killed it. And I really enjoyed each and every one of your um, talks and conversations. They were very inspiring. So again, I'm Sarah and I'm a youth advisor to the Youth Advisory Committee at Reaction for Inclusion. And welcome to the celebration of Black History Month. It is a phenomenal month to celebrate and today we want to have an open and honest conversations about Black history and in the future. I'll be moderating a panel session today and we'll love to know more about Black history through our amazing speakers as well as through our youth speakers. Eon, Allison, Brittany, we have some questions for you. Let's go with Eon first, then Allison, and then Brittany. So you guys have roughly three to four minutes to answer the question. And the first one is, how do you feel your Blackness makes you feel invisible in society? How has being visibly Black been an obstacle for you? And how do you feel your Blackness is seen in society? Eon, you can go first. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, great, uh, great uh, introduction to ask. Um, so in terms of when I feel invisible or I feel, you know, Blackness makes you invisible, um, you know, I thought back through, through my own experiences and it's places like, um, you know, growing up it, it here um, and going to school in the suburbs, you know, um, where I'd be the only Black student in my class or my grade or whatever. Um, there's moments where you're in that classroom and you feel invisible because there isn't someone that necessarily um, is speaking to your experience or is looking to you for, um, for answers, expecting you to have them um, because you are different. Um, and then it flips, suddenly it can flip in, at the drop of an instant where you're extremely visible and all eyes are on you being, you know, depending on the situation, if it comes to a topic dealing with race relations or something very topical that has to do with um, Blackness, then all of a sudden that invisibility becomes super visible and both are equally uncomfortable places to be, um, or it can, it can be uh, equally uncomfortable places to be. Um, so that's one place. Um, I'd say in positions of power, um, you know, that's a place where I find Black people tend to be invisible. I look around the world. Um, and there's many reasons for that. Institutionally, there are a lot of places where, um, you know, the, the actual, um, the, the, the rules and laws and regulations of the land don't account for everyone. Um, and so just by, by virtue of that, um, nations have been built in ways that don't account for all the people that inhabit them and contribute to them anymore. So I would say that those are places where I feel um, Blackness is invisible. Um, in terms of how it's been an obstacle to me, that's one of the toughest questions because that's kind of the problem is I don't know. You know, I'm not sure if it's been an obstacle to me all the time. It, it might, maybe there have been opportunities that, you know, I didn't get access to based on not being, you know, good enough for delivering, but maybe not. And I don't really know. And, and the problem is when you're Black, I think that question can linger when things don't necessarily pan out as they seem to pan out for other people that do the same things. So you're left wondering, was it something that I was capable or incapable of? Or is it just the color of my skin or that I, I appear different? Um, and then in terms of how it's seen in society, I think, you know, Blackness has a lot of different angles. It can be super cool in a lot of areas of society. It's really cool to be Black if you're an artist or an athlete. Um, it can also be very threatening. When, you know, walking down the street, there are those stereotypical things that people say about purses being clutched and so on. And I've experienced those things. And, you know, being a very non-threatening person, you start to absorb that, okay, it has to be because I look different because I'm not doing anything different to anyone else on this street. So, um, so yeah, that's what I would uh, say to answer that question, I think. Yes, thank you for sharing. That's an amazing answer. Uh, Allison? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, I echo a lot of what Eon says because my experience has been similar. So with school being the only black person most of the time at work, being the only black person, and then just in so many spaces. And what that does is you're hyper visible because 
anything black people come to you you know like oh my goodness Allison you're black so what do you think about this and when they're asking they're asking me as if I'm the representative of all black people like I'm speaking for all black people and then the other thing too is people assume we all know each other so sometimes you know someone might say oh where are you from oh Zimbabwe oh really I know Eon Eon's from Guyana do you know him and I'm thinking Guyana, Zimbabwe. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that happens all the time. And I feel like we're hyper visible. And I think people don't have a sense of like boundaries sometimes with black people, because people will ask you the strangest things that are personal, but they feel like it's okay. Like, is that your real hair? Um, how did you do that? That must have taken forever. Can I, or people just touch, right? Like they just touch your hair. They touch your kid's hair. They comment on your body in ways that they wouldn't comment on other people's bodies. You know what I mean? Like, oh my, you know, black people are so athletic. I, right. I know this about black people. And it's very dehumanizing because if I turned around and said anything to someone not black and said, oh, you know, this race of people are so this, like you could hear a pin drop like after that comment, you know, but I, I feel like society as a whole, like we're hyper visible in that people can see us and feel like they can say whatever, but our humanity is invisible. People aren't seeing deeper, which is like frustrating and annoying. And then, you know, again, like what Eon said on me, like big lips is not good you know, big bum is not good on me. Like everything that's black is not good on black people. Braids are not good on me. You know what I mean? Like in the States, in a lot of places, it's illegal to have your braids to work, like, which is ridiculous. And that's why, you know, the Crown Act is like amazing, historical, but it's ridiculous that there has to be legislature around how my hair grows out of my head or how I choose to wear my hair, you know? So it's this weird space where you're constantly trying to, you know, like I was saying, stuff it down, stuff it down. So you don't seem threatening. If I'm at the grocery store, um, before I go, I'm thinking, oh no, I just put on a hoodie and baggy clothes. People might think I'm stealing. Okay, let me wear something tighter. So no one thinks I've put something under my, you know? So it's that constant negotiating um, and trying to keep yourself safe, but also trying to make yourself palatable to people like digestible like okay if I dress like this I won't seem threatening if I talk like this I won't seem threatening or aggressive or loud or this like it's that constant you can't be yourself and I wonder um actually my sister said this we were talking and she said she doesn't know who she would be if she hadn't grown up in a place where she was always the only black person because now she wonders, is she accommodating because that's who she is? Or is it because it was a safety thing? You know, and I think about that a lot. I'm like, who would I have been as a person? What would my personality be like if I didn't grow up in a predominantly, you know, non-white, uh, non-black environment? And I think that's something that I struggle with a lot, but also that whole idea that all black people are the same, like there's no difference. But as black folks, we know that yes, we do have that shared understanding and experience of, okay, as black people, a lot of us are experiencing this and that, but there's also, we see difference. Like we know that people from the Caribbean eat food that's different from people in Africa and within Africa as well, people are eating lots of different food. People are speaking different languages. People have different customs, but that sort of, lost in translation somehow like in the greater society everybody feels there's one way to be black so when you are achieving and maybe excelling people feel like oh you're an exception because black people don't excel here so I, I I think a lot of times it's navigating that and I mean Eon said it like he said it all because I'm also like where would I be if I wasn't visibly black, right? Or if we didn't live in a society that it that hates, you know, blackness so much when it's in black people, but celebrates it, consumes it, and loves it so much when it's other people, right? Performing blackness. Like that's cool. 
but me just being me it's criminal like something's wrong with it I totally see that like thank you so much Allison that was a wonderful insight I agree with the comment about the hair I I actually see I relate to that in many ways uh now Brittany Definitely. I echo all of those sentiments Eon and Allison shared. Totally resonates with me. And for me personally, when it comes to how do I feel my Blackness makes me invisible in society, for me personally, what I've noticed is people who are white or like non-Black people are seen as neutral. So if a non-Black person or a white person enters into a space, you're judged and you're characterized based on your actions, maybe things you say, you know, how you express yourself, that defines you. So no one's going to look at you and as a, a person who's white and say, oh, this person is most likely to behave this way or this way or that way, because they look at you as an individual and identify you as a person who has their own ability to make their their own life choices and be whoever they want to be. So you have that opportunity to be seen as a neutral individual. But when you're Black, you aren't given that same privilege. So when someone looks at you, they see a history of trauma. They see, you know, what the media portrays when you, you see a Black person. They see all the various stereotypes associated with Black individuals. You know, they see the historic you know, a lot of the historic um, situations that have impacted Black people, whether that be like, you know, institutionalized racism or whether it be situations involving police brutality or even looking at um, the criminalization of Black skin. That's something as well that a lot of times when you're Black, you're always in defense mode and people are looking at you from that place of you have to prove yourself innocent. So they're already assuming you're guilty. So perfect example, for me, whenever I walk into a grocery store, I always have my receipt in my hand because I know they're going to, if they're going to pick anyone out, they're going to pick me. And they're going to interrogate me based on thinking that I stole something. So I'm always ready if I go into like a Walmart or a Target, I'm like, okay, Brittany, hold your receipt because they're going to stop you. If they're stopping anyone, it's going to be me. And another thing as well, and this is just kind of things you have to, you know, develop as a Black person. For me personally, if I see a store and I walk in, say I'm in Eden Center or any mall and I'm walking through the mall and I see a store and there's no one in that store, I don't even bother to go in there. And if there's no one Black in the store, I don't even bother because I know instantly I'm going to be followed within that store all the time and that's like some of the negative experiences being black where automatically people are assuming you're going to commit a crime or do do something negative and you always have to prove people that prove people wrong you know and it's a constant you know battle of not having to represent everyone and being seen as a neutral person and that's something unfortunately when you're black you're not afforded that and that allows you know, the invisibility to come into play where when you're looked at, you're not seen, just as Allison has said, you're not seen as an individual human. You're seen as a collective of a lot of the different ups and downs and struggles and a lot of the, you know, um, the stereotypes and, and the negative stigma that society puts on Black people because of that, you know, element of, you know, assumption that comes into play. In addition to that, another experience, and, and this is kind of me just talking about like some of the, the microaggressions that are associated with that, but another experience is even when I was in like university, a lot of times and my university was majority white, a lot of times doing group work was the worst feeling ever. I hated group work just because everyone in my university assumed that because I'm black, I am not going to be participating in the work or I'm going to make the group fail. So a lot of times I can count like multiple times where I would want to join a group and nobody would pick me and I would be left standing there and the professor would have to say, okay, Brittany, you, you're going to do really great in this. And, and the, I've had times where the professors would have to big me up and say, oh, Brittany's fantastic. Like she got A's in this class. Anyone who has Brittany in her team, like she's, she's going to kill it. And that's how they would actually try to overcome a lot of the 
you know, pieces where people would make assumptions that I would make them fail, you know, and there's all those different elements that are associated with those stereotypes that unfortunately add to your invisibility. And then on top of that as well, when you're overall looking at how society looks at you, it can be a, a burden sometimes being a, a Black person just because society is seeing you, you know, from that lens of, you know, the historic trauma and all of these different, you know, negative stereotypes and not understanding that a lot of times in society, they've also contributed to that experience. And even this happens a lot whenever there's any form of advocacy or any form of like inclusion related work. Usually when you're a black person, you're, you know, the main person that is given all that responsibility because you're assumed to be a person who's already, especially if you're a black woman, you're already assumed to be the person who is stronger, who can carry all of that legwork. And a lot of times people who are a part of white communities don't see their, their involvement in that, where a lot of times black people are experiencing you know, like racism and a lot of discrimination. And so the people who are a part of society perpetuating that should be a part of the, the, the solution. And unfortunately that doesn't happen all the time. And that's kind of one of the challenges when it comes to, you know, being a black person in, in this society. Wow, thank you so much, Brittany. Again, another enlightening answer. And I do have to agree. It's unfortunate that there are stereotypes and that we have to face discrimination. Um, question two. So what supports or protections would have been useful when you were younger that you did not have? Eon? Yeah, thanks for the question, Sarah. And those answers, Allison, have been the same um, experiences that I've had um, being echoed by what you guys are saying as well. The best thing to focus on support wise um, as a youth, and I think a thing that could really affect a good change is um, focusing on the curriculum um, and the education system in general. I mean, there are a lot of issues with the education system. It's a, we, we do benefit from a really strong um, education system here in Canada compared to other nations, but that doesn't mean it's beyond improvement and there's lots of room for improvement. Um, and one area that has consistently just been in dire need of, of, uh, of some help and being addressed is um, ethnoculturalism, just the idea of sharing, sharing our cultures in a way where we can all learn from each other and get a sense of understanding which will then, in my opinion, breed empathy. And once you have empathy, then you can start to take care of each other. Once you understand somebody, you can help them. You can, you know, you start to listen to them differently if you start to understand them and you really hear them, then you can start to make changes that uh, actually address the issue. So um, I would, you know, I, I think it would be really great to um, address what we're teaching in schools, how it's being taught, who's teaching it, who's teaching it to who, why that's happening, um, and maybe a little bit more questioning of that system um, can help us, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great starting point to, to build a great society because everyone here has to go to school. <laughs> you know, we all have to go to school. So if we're all going there and learning a little bit more about how to interact properly with each other, learning more about how to share our cultures. Um, I think we might be able to slowly dissolve some of these barriers and obstacles that, that consistently seem to exist and, and seem to go nowhere. Well, thank you, Eon, for that thought-provoking question answer. Um, Allison? Yeah, I would have to say, um, I think who is teaching, so two things. So who is teaching and who they are as people, I think would make a huge difference, but also who works in the school systems, who's providing all the supports, because I remember, I mean, there were several experiences I had in high school um, that were horrible. So when I moved uh, to Canada, we lived in Montreal first, and then we moved to BC. So when we moved to BC, I should have been put in grade 12, because in Montreal, I skipped two grades, you know, because the testing there was different. 
So I should have been put in grade 12, but when we got to BC, even with my grade grade, the headmistress, I can't remember, principal, <laughs> was like, no, she's like, no, you know, why would we want to put her with people who are not her age? Besides, like, I don't know if she's that, you know, smart, like maybe let's let her redo the grades, whatever. And I had to redo the grades, which was ridiculous. But my mom at the time, she's a new immigrant to Canada. You know, she's just like, oh, okay, whatever, not a big deal. But I experienced that several times, like in that high school where, even though my grades were great, the teachers would act like I am a problematic student. I'm not doing well. They would recommend I take remedial lessons, you know, after school, which made no sense because I was actually a tutor. You know what I mean? Um, also, I had a very racist teacher for social studies who he would literally fail me like every assignment and test I would fail. And when I would compare to other people, because, you know, social studies, it's almost one of those courses where there's one right-ish answer. Like if they say, who did this? Well, it's that person, right? And when I would compare to my peers, my answers would be wrong, but it's the same thing as someone else who got it right. And eventually, after lots of complaining from my mom, they just switched my class as opposed to doing anything to the teacher. So it's like, is every black student just not going to go into that class? So I feel that as a whole, there has to be some accountability for teachers who are racist or show bias towards their students or other you know, educators who do the same thing because same thing happened with my counselor at school who's supposed to encourage you and help you with university applications. I was telling her, I want to do this. I want to go to university. And she's telling me, you know, you should go to hair school. And she's giving me like applications for like hair school. And I'm saying, well, no, like I need you to help me with university applications. So I think if there was some accountability within the system where it's treat everybody the same, like don't bring your conceptions or even if it was a blind system where everything maybe was virtual and you they couldn't see who they're you know doing stuff to maybe that would help because I feel like as soon as people saw I was black they decided well you're not good at math you're not good at this you're not good at this but sports oh yeah all the sports coaches are approaching me like even for basketball and I'm five two but they're like yeah you, you're probably great at basketball so I think having that and I think also mentorship programs for young you know, people, especially if you're Black in a city with no Black people, like I was one of two Black people in my school, and I was in a huge school, but nobody really, you know, took an interest and gave me mentorship or talked to me about, you know, this is how you can build resilience, because you're gonna need it. This is how you can be encouraged and have, you know, self-confidence to know that you can do it and keep pushing it. So if I didn't personally have that, I mean, what would have happened, right? And we can't put it on youth to say, you need to be a self-starter. You need to be self-motivated. You need to keep pushing even when people say no. And when I was young, I didn't um, necessarily recognize it as racism in the same way I do now, but I definitely 100% knew I was being treated differently. And the only thing I could see that was different about me from the other kids was that I was black. So I think just having, you know, more training for teachers to, you know, think about unconscious bias and all those things, but also providing mentorship for, you know, students who are black or newcomers to Canada or, you know, other things like that. So that even if let's say their teachers or the people around them at school aren't being positive, you know, towards them, they have someone who, you know, can help them navigate, like, and plan for their future careers or whatever they want to do. Thank you so much, Allison. I think mentorship is very important. And thank you for sharing. Next, we have Brittany. Thank you. And I totally agree with everything Eon and Allison shared. And one thing that came to mind, Allison, I had the exact same experience, but kind of like in the opposite way. So 
for me, when it comes to my background, I was actually born in Canada. And then my parents took myself and all my siblings to Ghana and West Africa, where our families originally from. And then after being in um, Ghana for almost like a decade, came back to Canada and had to re-enter the school system. So it was really weird for me just having to like transition and move around and be a part of so many different cultures. So when I came back to Canada, I was thinking that, okay, I'll just go into the normal grades, just as Allison had mentioned. And for some reason, the guidance counselors did not want me to go into the grade that I was in. And it made no sense to me, but that time I really didn't have like anyone to advocate for me. I'm just trying to like go to school. So I ended up having, you know, to go back a year because they refused to put me in that specific course. It's funny thing is my brother had the exact same experience, my younger brother, but my mom was actually there to advocate for him. So when they were trying to do that to him, my mom came to the school and said, you guys aren't going to do that to, to him. You did that to his sister. Stop that. And then finally, when she spoke up, they actually basically listened and put him into the class he belonged to. And that kind of like just highlights some of the you know challenges where there needs to be, even within school systems, there needs to be advocacy, you know, related organizations that are actually holding schools accountable to ensure that you know, students who are part of the Black community aren't being, you know, disenfranchised and discriminated against within the school system. And even data collection. So like collecting that information, like Allison had the exact same experience as me. My brother had the same experience. There's, everyone is having the same experience, but unfortunately, because there isn't a collection of information and people aren't gathering that information, there isn't that awareness. And a lot of times when it comes to addressing, you know, um, racism or any form of discrimination, unfortunately, because of the systems that we live in and, you know, being in it, like a, in a lot of institutions that are, you know, foundationally like racist, written with racism, unfortunately, if you don't have the data to back it up, there isn't, you know, any incentive to actually bring about a solution. So I really believe that schools, and communities need to start collecting this data. There needs to be, you know, accountability put in place, and there needs to be advocacy organizations that are holding schools and hold, holding our communities in place to ensure that we're addressing a lot of these barriers that are affecting Black communities. Thank you again, Brittany. That was a wonderful answer. I agree that we need advocacy and really just standing up for Black students and really just really making sure that they get the education that they really need. So our last question is a very special one. I believe that youth leadership is powerful to bring about changes. So I would like to ask you, Eon, Allison, and Brittany, to share briefly what your thoughts are on this question. So what are some of the ways that the younger generation of Canada can make change in their schools and communities? Um, Eon? Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, based on what Allison and Brittany were just saying, I think we've kind of touched on some of the things that we, we feel need to be addressed for young people. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about, you know, what, what to tell young people about addressing this issue. And I think the first and the most important thing is just to um, not to be afraid to um, to call it out when you see it, not to be afraid to tell somebody that something doesn't feel right or something's wrong or that you feel that you're being just pushed in different ways that it doesn't feel right, you know? Um, or if, if you fully recognize something that's happening, um, you know, in particular to somebody based on how they look or what they believe, um, yeah, just immediately calling it out in a way and having the confidence to do it. Um, I think, you know, sometimes that's the hardest part is just maybe not feeling confident or feeling alone. I mean, we all um, have expressed, um, you know, experiences of being the only black person in a situation. And when you're that person and you feel that energy, it can be very overwhelming and difficult to figure out what to do. Do you run, do you stay, do you laugh long? Do you, you know, what do you do? Um, but as I've gotten older, I've realized that there, there are probably more people in your corner than you maybe even realize. Um, and the, um, 
I guess the the analogy that kind of came to mind was kind of like being the front, being the front of the people, like the the paper people chain, you know, like those paper people chains that you cut them out and then you pull it out. So when you cut it out, there's only the one person and that, that, that one person might be experiencing a lot of things, but just know that, you know, there's a lot of people behind you in that moment, whether it's me, Allison, Brittany, friends, family, um, people that you care about that you know, understand the right things that should be happening and that care about you in those situations. Um, hopefully that gives young people the confidence to say, hey, you know, classmate, teacher, principal, store clerk, police officer, <laughs> this isn't right. And I'm gonna tell you that and, I, and people need to know. So um, I think that that might be one of the first things is just trying to develop that confidence to say, hey, I see it, it's not right. I'm letting you know that I know it's not right. Yeah, thank you so much, Ion. I like that paper uh, chain analogy. Um, yes, I totally agree that it can be scary at times confronting these things, but you just need to have the confidence to do it. Allison? Yeah, I would have to say question everything. Question everything because um, now that I'm not as young, I'm still young, but <laughs> you know, I feel like so much of my education was a lie. There were a lot of omissions and then there were a lot of outright lies. So I would encourage youth, question everything. If you're being taught something in schools, question it like, hmm, why is this? Do your research for yourself. Don't just be a passive participant in life or in education or anything. Just question everything. Ask questions, you know, probe deeper for yourself. Um, because I think that would help a lot. That would have helped me a lot. But I think if everyone was doing that, or a lot of people were doing that, there would be change. Because then if a lot of, you know, young people are going home and saying, oh, mom, dad, what they're teaching at school is actually not correct. This is what they're telling us. Your parents are going to be like, what? This is what they say. And that parent's going to complain. And the more parents complain, I feel like that's how change is going to happen by questioning everything. Let's not assume that what we heard is true. And not, let's not assume that the first thing we saw on Google is true either. But I think if we question everything and we also think critically about where is this information coming from? From what lens, right? From what perspective is it coming from? Because that also makes a difference in how a story, a story is told. Because I think if we think about, um, if we do something when we're younger and we are the ones who tell our parents first, it's gonna be a very different version from the version that let's say the person who was supposed to be watching you or you know, like someone older might say. So I think if we think about that and question everything um, and also it's not rude to do that if you're you know, asking politely, right? Let's not be aggressive or confrontational about it, but let's be inquisitive like, huh, you know, why do you think that? Why did you react that way when that black person came to the store, you know, why did you, if we question all these things, I think we can start disrupting, dismantling and changing and learning, unlearning all the things. And it'll be in real time, you know, for young people, which is great because for us, we're like going back now to be like, oh, I was miseducated. Let me, you know, go back now and learn properly. But I think as young people, you have such a unique opportunity to do it in real time and see, you know, change happen in real time for you. Wow, thank you so much, Allison. I think asking questions and really just learning and researching is a very important step and like really going towards change as we're getting educated on how we can, you know, dismantle and break down these barriers that Black people have to face. And Brittany? Definitely, so totally agree with what everyone shared. And just to add to that, being able to identify your privilege. So everyone here has different privileges. So say if you're a person who, you know, was born in Canada, English is your first language, you're, you know, uh, a cis gender male or woman, you're a white male, white woman, by a, being able to identify your privileges, that's where you can be able to be a better ally 
and being able to, you know, assert yourself in situations. And just as everyone said, being able to speak out against situations. So if you know that you hold privilege and you're able to identify privilege, and a lot of times when we speak about privilege, people assume that, okay, um, I wasn't, you know, given anything, like I, I wasn't born rich or, you know, like I'm just like everyone else, like maybe I'm just white or I'm just a male or anything like that. But the, the thing with privilege is privilege isn't about the things you've been given. It's about the barriers you're not experiencing. So as an individual, you may not know that you have certain privileges, and that's because you don't have to know about those things because you're given that opportunity to, you know, navigate the world without having to, you know, understand that there's going to be people who will treat you differently. And there's going to be experiences that you will have that other people who have various opportunities may not have. So that's one thing to be aware of your privilege. And then I believe Allison and Ian touched on this as well is being aware of your bias as well. So we all have different like biases. We all have, you know, different things that the media, society, just our upbringing, sometimes family, parents, you know, and all of society has given us, you know, different thoughts and ideas about what a black person is and what, you know, diversity is and what's positive about a black person, what's negative. We all have those stereotypes and those biases. But the key thing to be able to bring about change is being able to identify those as well and check them. So when you see someone, perfect example, um, Allison had mentioned, you know, when you see, you know, someone who is like navigating a different space and like you're, you're, what's it called, going into a store or whatever, and you know, someone's assuming because you're wearing a hoodie that this person's stealing, that's a bias showing up. So that person, so if you make an assumption and perfect example is say you're sitting on the train and someone black sits beside you, is your instinct to move away or get up and move because your instinct is telling you that that person might be you know, engaged in some type of criminal activity or there's something wrong with them? That's a bias that you have to check. So in order for us to change our society, we have to be able to identify our biases, identify our privileges and check those so we can make the world we live in better for all of us. And intent, and by doing that, we'll lead to a society where there's less experiences of racism. And also when it comes to like our institutions, our schools, you know, our various, you know, like major organizations and things like that, there's a lot of, you know, experiences black people will have navigating these spaces, but by checking your privilege and identifying your bias, when you become a leader in these different spaces, you're going to be able to mitigate or like get rid of those negative experiences and lead to spaces that are safer for black people and by making environments safer for black people you're making them safer for everyone and that's something we have to know if there's people who are at the you know the bottom when it comes to you know experiencing you know like when it comes to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs when you look at like self-actualization as the highest point or just being valued as the highest point whoever's at the bottom if you're able to support that person and lift them up and provide them with the safety and the resources they need everyone else on top you know of the community everyone else whether that be people with disabilities people who are white people who are you know of varying genders everyone benefits because we're putting measures in place that support the bottom. And when you have a solid foundation, you have a building that stands. And that's where we have to approach when it comes to, you know, being more inclusive and being, you know, advocates and just creating an environment that's safe for everyone. Wow, thank you so much, Brittany. I totally agree. Creating an environment that's safe for everyone is really important and can help everyone strive in society. So thank you so much, Allison, Brittany, for your amazing and Allison, Brittany, and Eon for your amazing, insightful answers. Now we have our awesome youth advisors and leaders that would like to share our thoughts to the question. I will go first and answer why, how I think as young leaders, we are able to bring changes to our community. So I believe that the younger and future generations of Canada can really make significant changes in the schools and community when it comes to talking about Black history and tackling systemic racism 
stereotypes, and that discrimination that sadly exists today in society. So my experience as a Black individual has been to constantly prove to others that I deserve good things and that I am worthy of a place in this society. People have these preconceived notions be about, meeting before, about me before even getting to know me. For instance, they think I'm not smart or intelligent enough when I work hard in school and I get all A's and I've gotten scholarships. I've been recognized for my um, schoolwork, but they don't take that to account because they just see the color of my skin. Or another conceived, um, another preconceived notion is that Black women are strong and tough. And yes, that's good, but it can also cause damage because um, this actually dehumanizes Black women and prevents them from accessing the healthcare system and mental care resources because they think, oh, you're strong, you don't need any help. So it's these types of stereotypes and notions that prevent us from actually moving forward. So to me, it's important that Black history isn't only about recognizing the slavery and racial trauma experience in the past, but it's important that we recognize how this has impacted Black people today. And Black history is also about celebrating the amazing contributions Black people have made in this world and recognize that we are worthy and that we should be treated equally. It is also important that we ensure that Black people have access to all sectors in society, education, healthcare, ability to achieve their dreams and, full, and reach full potential without even having any racial barriers and stereotypes in the way. So to me, like what youth can do is really educate others and taking the time to listen to Black individual experiences. I feel like in school all the time, whenever we learned about Black history, people would be like, oh, that's so sad. Like, why did they have to do that? And it's like, it is sad, but they never ask, what can we do to solve this and move forward? How is this impacting people today? They realize that, oh, it's in the past. It's, it's, there's no racism. Like, there's no slavery. There's no segregation laws. But it's, it still impacts people today. People don't have the opportunities to move forward because of what we've done in the past. So it's really important that we listen to our experiences. Also, I believe that having a wide array of representation in diverse books, shows, media, film, that not only focus on slavery and trauma is very important because we get many of our precons our stereotypes and thoughts about how other people from media and films and what we see um, on the news or things like that. So it's important that we have a positive, really important positive um, presentation representation of Black people in these books and shows and media and films so people don't have these stereotypes. So yeah, I think those are the first steps that we should really take in creating change in our community. So Drew, how can how do you think young leaders today can bring change to the community? Um, yeah, so in school, when they talk about Black history, I don't think they talk about it enough. They, the teachers, even the youth should be more open in talking about it because it's something that shouldn't be ignored. And more people need to be educated. And maybe if it's just simple as making a group in school, like there's so many um, diversity and inclusion groups at school, but I don't see one that is an inclusive space for Black people to come and talk about their feelings and their opinions and they can talk about what they can do and what we can do. Thank you so much, Drew. Megan? I think we said bringing changes to social media platforms through people saying Black Lives Matter, it is very powerful to send messages to everyone trying to learn about it. Social media platforms are especially valuable to finding change to happen because you see it all the time, such as Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, or any other kind of social media. And that's what I think. Thank you, Megan. I agree. Social media is another tool that's really powerful in educating others. And Jesse. Yeah, for me, it's about allowing people in the broader community to share the challenges and being able to express what makes them stronger. Uh, people are always finding a way to address challenges and people should know more about it. And, and the people who are part of a Black history, 
of passing on the, the knowledge and the lessons and the teachings of, of Black history. And honestly, everybody who is, who is either, everybody who is Black or, or African American or anyone who is part of that particular uh, part of uh, Black history, they should, everybody should rem remember those who have broken all barriers, which is both powerful and unique at the same time. And people should also express emotions like kinds of emotions that is based around their own their own livelihood, like kindness, happiness, um, their own use of friendship, um, their own courage, and their own own use of um, other types of emotions and feelings. And something that is worth passing on that allows them to keep moving forward, that allows them to keep to keep thriving and to keep them doing the things that they love doing just because it's not how they do it, it's by why they do it and why they allow to do the things to not only try to make an example, but to show what Black history is Black, Black History Month is all about. And for example, there's a lot of historical people, like for instance, Martin Luther King. He was, a, he back in the 1960s, he was like one of the most influential spokesmen and he was fighting for civil rights. And he never stopped because he strongly, because he believed that anybody who is, that all people should, should learn to coexist together instead of fighting. And it has been happening ever since back in the early years of when slavery began and how, and how that transitions through that until later in the 1960s when the civil rights was being fought by, was being fought by Martin Luther King. And another great historical figure, figure is Barack Obama when he became the first African-American president of the United States because he strongly believed about what the people want, people who are white or black. Everybody really, when Barack Obama became president, he feels like he, feels like he wants to do something that's for the people. He wants because he cares about the people and he cares about what they what they are what he's willing to give them. And and I believe everyone is taking historical knowledge from the people who who became an inspiration for Black History Month. And it's something that we need to every, everybody is hearing and learning today and how and how Black History Month is, isn't just a month, it's about remembering the things that has happened and how we, how we people who are either white or black have been able to learn and how we have to live with that every single day during this month. And another great historical figure is George Floyd. Now we all know what happened to George Floyd and how that from that day became a movement called Black Lives Matter. And how that really everyone was fighting for their rights because they they strongly believe that they they strongly believe that everyone needs to they need to stop this, they need to put an end to this whole this whole situation, this whole killing. And because of that, Black Lives Matter not only became a movement, but it became a mission that allows people who are white and black to stand up and fight for what's right. And how and that is how Black History Month, how this month of is not only just the month to remember the historical figures, the historical people. But it's also about remembering the events that has happened since the very beginning and how we are continually learning from this 
every single day during this month of Black History Month. Thank you so much, Jesse. Another wonderful answer. And um, thank you, everyone, for this panel discussion. I will now like to um, take it on to Palki.